Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and uh, I'm in a little different place today. I'm actually in North Georgia, in the uh, North Georgia mountains on Lake Blue Ridge, enjoying some relaxing time with my family. And so we are looking at Romans chapter 13 today, uh, day 168. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word, for the truth that it speaks to us, for the life that it imparts to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Write your word in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no governing authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the evildoer, wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That is Romans 13 in the English Standard Version. As always, we're using esv.org from Crossway to display the text on screen. And it's a great website. Told you that before. Romans 13, we're continuing in the practical application of the truth of the gospel. And so we saw last time that we were in Romans that the whole statement that summarizes this whole last part of Romans is Romans 12, 1. And that is when Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is the commandment. What do we do? How do we live as people whose lives have been changed by the gospel, who have received the mercies of God through Christ, who've been justified, who are being sanctified, who are longing for that day when we will be glorified. For those who are in Christ, what now? Well, now we live as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. And that is our reasonable worship. ESV says spiritual worship, but the word translated spiritual is actually logical. uh, It's kind of the cognate of that. So it's our reasonable worship. It's It's only logical. It's only reasonable in light of all that God has done for us, all that we are in Christ, all that he has written on our hearts and done Uh, for us and in us. It's only reasonable that we would respond in worship by having everything in our lives be an act of worship. We are living sacrifices. That means that every aspect of our lives, everything about us is an act of worship. So what does that look like practically? Well, we looked at lots of things from Romans 12, and we're continuing to see other things in Romans 13. And the big things here, 
is it ought to change the way we think about government, those who are in governing authority over us. Our relationship to them ought to be part of our ongoing worship to God. How so? Well, when we see that the governing authorities have been instituted by God, that they are from God, so we receive government, even though government is human, fallible, corrupt, errors. I mean, all those things are true. Listen, Paul was living under the Roman Empire. The governor, the, the emperor of Rome at the time was Nero, who was a guy who was a deviant and psychotic, and he would end up killing Christians, including Paul. And the Roman Empire had a lot of bad things about it. It, it officially promoted emperor worship. It officially sanctioned idolatrous worship throughout. It, it, it entertained the masses by killing people in the Colosseums and uh, in other places throughout the Roman Empire. It's estimated that the Roman Empire throughout its, its dominant period killed two to three million people as public spectacle for the entertainment of the masses. So this is not this is not what we would call a god honoring, god fearing government or empire. But but Paul says of that empire and of that government, they are from God and they've been instituted by God. We see this consistently throughout scripture. Cyrus, the first king of Persia, is called by name in Isaiah to be the one to restore his people to the land. Well, God, throughout the book of Isaiah and other prophets, pronounces judgment upon different nations because all the nations are made by God. All the nations are held accountable to God. All the nations are under God's authority. Well, that means that whatever authority is over us is from God given to us. And what we ought to do is not resist those who are in authority, but we ought to honor them. We ought to obey doing what is good. Now, of course, if the government asks us to do something that is in itself evil, right, something that is sinful, then we wouldn't do it. And we can't do it because we cannot, we cannot choose to obey man disobeying God. But as long as what the government is asking us to do is appropriate, uh, not sinful, right? Not a violation of God's commandments, then they are God's instituted authority and we ought to do it. Parents have this with their children. Parents have authority over their children. As long as the parent's not asking the child to do something that's sinful, the child needs to obey and honor the parents. And not that government is our parents, but it's another God instituted authority structure and we must be in subjection. He says, this is very, very clear language, very strong language. In fact, those who resist, verse two, will incur judgment. Verse five, therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So you get two big reasons. Submit to the governing authorities. They're given to you by God. Why? Well, if you don't submit to them, you're gonna suffer God's judgment for it because they are God's authorities over you. Oh, that's bad. Why else? Well, because of conscience. Because God has given you the authorities for the good. Government is a creational good. Yes, it's affected by the fall. No government is perfect. All those caveats. But government itself is a creational good given by God to promote order and peace. That same Roman government that did all those horrible things also instituted the Pax Romana. They were able to institute a peace that really encompassed the Mediterranean world that allowed for the free flow of the gospel because there were highways, roads that were safe, guarded by Roman garrisons. There were markets in towns where trade was happening. There was commerce among different people groups. Those are all good things that come from God, and so we ought to honor them. And then in verse 7, he tells us specifically what that honoring would look like. You pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Um, there are some Christians I've seen on social media and even heard in real life who say things like, uh, yeah, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, you know, child of God. And then they turn around and say things like, well, taxation is theft. You shouldn't pay your taxes because taxation is theft. Like, did you read the Bible? <laughs> or are you just the kind of person who says, I can just take a black Sharpie to my Bible and cross out the verses I don't like. So when it says, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are, I just take a Sharpie and go right through that because I don't like it because I think taxation is theft. No, 
you're not really given that freedom to edit God's word that way. Uh, and so you have to obey it or you're going to suffer judgment and you're also going to defile your own conscience if you don't do so. So the first thing we're told in Romans 13 is what our, what our position toward the governing authorities should be. And it should be one of submission and honor, respect, obedience, because they are given to us by God. The second thing we're told is that we need to love everyone and that we don't need to have debt. So owe nothing to anyone or no, owe no one anything except to love one another. So we do owe everyone love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. He's thinking in particular of the second uh, tablet of the law. Uh, shall not commit adultery, shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not covet. That's the second table of the law or the, the fifth through tenth commandments. And the fulfillment of that is basically love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said there are two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And these two commandments sum up all the law. The first great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, sums up the first four commandments. And then love your neighbor as yourself sums up the next six commandments. And so these are, those are some people playing in the lake behind us, so you can hear that because the microphone's going to pick it up. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so we are to love. We are to love everyone because if we love God, we will want to obey him. And part of obeying him is loving others, loving everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then finally, the third major thing. So we have government, we have love, and then we have uh, obe obedience, righteous living. Live as daytime people and not as nighttime people is the uh, imagery that Paul uses here. There's the time of the night when people are asleep and when horrible, wicked things are, have always taken place in the history of human civilization, right? Under the cover of darkness, that's when orgies and drunkenness and, and you know, all sorts of things happen. You know, the uh, prostitutes come out to the street corners and all those kinds of things happen at night. I don't need to go into any more detail than that. But during the daytime, people generally live their lives sort of soberly and uprightly and take care of responsibilities and things like that. So he uses this as an image and he says to us, your time of spiritual night is gone. Before you knew Christ, before you had the mercies of God, you were in spiritual night. You were asleep in the dark. You were cut off from God. You were ignorant. You were in the dark. And so, of course, you lived as a nighttime person, right? But now it's the daytime. The sun has risen on you. You've received the mercies of God. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So live as one who has seen the light and who is awake in the light. Don't be asleep in the light. Don't be living as a person in darkness when you've been given light. That is not an appropriate way to live at all. And so that is something that we need to take to heart. So again, we're, we're continuing this application of the gospel. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? It means we honor the governing authorities. It means we love our neighbors. And it means that we live righteous lives as those who are in the light and not as those who are in the darkness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your waking us up and bringing us into the light of Christ and giving us a calling in the world as your ambassadors. Thank you for giving us our government. Thank you for uh, the president and the governor and Congress and the Supreme Court and our state legislatures and our county executives and our local sheriffs. Thank you for all these levels of government that are given by you to provide for peace and order within human societies. Do they work perfectly? No, Lord, we know that. We live in a fallen world but we should honor and respect that which you've given us. So help us to do that. Help us to have a, a basic disposition toward our government of honor and respect and obedience. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves, all of our neighbors, and help us to live as those who have been brought from darkness into light and who know what it means to live upright lives before your presence. We thank you, Father, for all of your goodness to us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Thank you so much for joining me for day 168. And tomorrow, day 169, guess where we're going? That's right, we're going back to Leviticus. So tomorrow, we will be back in Leviticus and picking up with Leviticus chapters 19 and 20 in the next two days. Hope you can join us for that. Have a blessed day in the Lord.